I was going to propose we go through chapter 2 again and then make our way to chapter 5 and then just sort of after that do the best we can to s just touch on some of the major points through chapter 10 if we can and then next week really <coughs> dive into uh, the next book which is for our fifth meeting which is the syllogism and, the, and it's three figures although we'll probably just make it through the first figure that's probably enough. So for next time please read uh, sections A1 to A6. This is the, the PDF of this book is linked on our website on the seminar page. So if you go to seminars and then you click on this seminar, on the bottom there's a link to all of the books, most of the books, one of which is the, uh, I think it's called the Fire Analytics by Hackett. It's the Hackett edition. Uh, but you can use any edition, so uh, for next meeting, um, read sections A1 through A6. Uh, in the prior analytics. And we've got the Hackett edition. I mean, I'm not an expert on sort of the translations and the various merits in English, but the Hackett edition seemed a little bit clearer than the other, but that's just the personal. But, you know, if you already have it, you know, it's yeah. the same thing. You know? This group has seemed clear. I think it's based on, on this translator. Yeah, so it's probably going to be the same thing. Um, for me, the syllogism is very difficult to understand and kind of wrestle with because I'm not a logician, but it's, it's very terse. It's very kind of compacted writing. Every sentence sort of carries meaning and we'll do our best to go through the first sections. We need to understand the syllogism and in in, in sort of the, uh, the three propositions. And you will see a lot of references to predication and a lot of the things that are mentioned in the categories. And then once we do that, we can then go to uh, Hegel, and Hegel in many ways rewrote and expanded and completed Aristotle's uh, original intention, if you will, in his own way. Uh, and then we can have the conversation on Hegel's uh, <coughs> Syllogism, what, what Hegel said about the syllogism and when he rewrote it in his own triad. You know? And then once we have Hegel, and of course we're not going to, so Hegel wrote two logics. He wrote the minor logic, which is part of his essentially lecture notes of the encyclopedia of, 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 of philosophical thought. So we're going to read the logic from the, what they call the minor logic, the earlier logic. And then there's the great science of logic, which is three volumes, a thousand pages of extraordinary complexity, and um, <laughs> we, we will probably just, I'll reference, like, I, I, I mean, it'll take me like 15 years at least to finish reading it, and probably all of us, but we can do it in 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> How did it take him to write those? Many years, years, over a decade, I think. Decade. Yeah. You know what they say about Hegel's lecturing style? It was very uncompromising. They said it was like death, it was like hearing death talking. <laughs> These were very severe, you know, Characters, but um, and then maybe if we do two two classes on Hegel's logic and the syllogism, maybe we'll just get to the Harvey article on Marx uh, that you should have. So I'll make everyone a copy, uh, and then we won't. I think we can have eight. We can extend it for a ninth meeting. We'll have some interruptions, but that's okay because it'll take some time to read these things. Are you going to have a meeting the night before Thanksgiving? You mean next week? I was hoping to have a meeting next. Is that? Are people not going to be here? I, I will be out of town. I don't know how many people will be out of town next week. You'll be okay. Two people but at I least. Can watch the video. I mean, uh, so we'll think about it. Yeah, we can have it because the following Wednesday we have class, right? There's nothing special the following Wednesday. I think so. Yeah. Oh, but I, I won't be here the following Wednesday <laughs> because you know my dad died, so we're going to go bury him. Yeah. Yes. So we're going to bury him. We're going to take him. Uh, from that Wednesday through the Monday, I'll be gone. So if we don't have class next week, we won't have class the, for the week after, and we'll, we'll meet the week after that. Mm. So we'll, let's think about it. We'll, yeah. we'll announce it online, you know, whether we'll have a class. By online, you mean you'll send us emails? And we'll send you emails, yeah. Because that way we would all get. Yes. And, and of course, if we meet next week, we probably will, we'll have the videos yeah. you know, uh, on YouTube. But, uh, and then next semester, I think we're going to have classes here as well, or maybe at the People's Forum, but I think it's going to be here. 
Next semester, we can just, if people are interested, we can just continue. I mean, we can start with the Hegel and the, and the Harvey article. And then Does just it have to be on Wednesday nights? No. I personally would love it not on Wednesday. I had to, I have three different commitments on Wednesday nights. I mean, we don't know when it's going to be next week. I mean, next semester, I can, we can have a, I, I'm totally open. I'll be probably teaching Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or we can have, a, I can ask people if they're interested in continuing next semester, what would be their best time, and then we'll find out. Uh, yeah, I can't do like Yeah, sure. Because then we can just continue reading without yeah, rushing, like see. Hegel, Marx, and then we can go to maybe, maybe Badu if I make sense of it by then, which I probably won't. We don't have to go to Badu. Yeah, it's too much. <laughs> it's something like, very, very interesting. Oh yeah, and very important for me. Yeah, uh, yeah. And for me, I mean, I'm you know, I, I don't mind trying to read it every year for the next five years. What about this Soviet guy? Is he? Oh, like, Yankov, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah, you for I'm reminding. Really interesting, Yankov. Yeah, so in I'm fact, in fact, with the Hegel, I read a few things. Uh, in Star Wars, Zizek talked about recently. Yes, recently. There's a renaissance. They're discovering that yeah. the that the Soviets actually have. He's critical. Yeah, but yeah. in an interesting way. Yeah. But yeah. you know, Ilyankov is a much greater thinker. I mean, much more important than Zizek, you know, in many ways. Because <laughs> oh, what Ilyankov yes. did was many things, one of which was he went through Aristotle and Hegel particularly and dug in and kind of rewrote it in modern 20th century language. To sort of keep it alive, you know. Mm. But um, he also did the Zagoras experiment, which I don't know if I mentioned last year, last time. No, well, I'll mention it when we talk about it. But I think, again, you reminded me, I think what we'll do when we do Hegel is we will read the Ilenkov article and the Hegel. So the Ilenkov is kind of like an introduction, if you will, uh -huh. um, where he talks about, like, what is dialectics. And I'll, I'll give you the, the excerpt. It's, from, it's an article that's been recently translated into English. So we'll read Ilenkov and then um, we'll do the Hegel. And then next semester we can read more of Ilenkov. Like, he wrote things about cybernetics. Awesome. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he killed himself. Um, he has this paper on um, sort of the. Anyways, it's we'll, we'll go there. But but he was he's a great thinker, and there's a renaissance happening now. Uh, okay, so for next time we'll we'll try to dive into sections A one through A six, and the categories are preparation for that, you know. Uh, and then the metaphysics, of course, is the mature version of what you're reading in the categories, but in a different way, sort of. In a, in in a way that's not directly interested in method and how to study what exists. It's more like Aristotle's final statement on the world that we live in, on being, and, you know. And so it's an incredible book, you know. Um, I, haven't, I haven't started that one yet. It's a special treat. Like, I, will. I know you read French, so you should read it in French. They say the French translation is even better. And you, I could get that too. But I don't know if that's true. So, okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so just to continue the story from last time, we're in chapter two, and I'm just going to summarize and move ahead. Um, let's see. So we are at book two and the fourfold division of being. And <clears throat> just to sort of make a sense of my notes here, which at this point I can't. In and of, of but not in. The fourfold division of? Both in. Division of. Does it make sense, or did I miss something? The fourfold division of being. Maybe that this part is not. In this book, the two fundamental relations, so one, 
two fundamental relations. And I'm repeating from last time, but I also want to add a few words here and there to clarify for myself and for us, hopefully, the two fundamental relations, which when combined, produce the fourfold division of being, right? And as we said last time, uh, the first one is things are said of something. Another, another way of thinking about this of what the meaning of said of is, is to ask what something is. When we ask what something is, what is Socrates, for example, we are in the field of said of a subject. So what is Socrates? Socrates is a human. An individual human. Or Socrates is an animal, right? Then we are saying something of Socrates, right? So this is sort of one way through which we communicate, i.e. we engage in creating meaning or making sense of the world. In other words, to, to say, for something to be said of some other thing means to, to ask the question, what something is. Okay. Again, we said this is a relation, this establishes a relation, a fundamental classification of two uh, I don't want to say identical things, but two, two things of a kind. For example, between a particular human being, like Socrates, and the species of human beings, right? Which, of course, fall under the genus mammals or animals or however you want, you want uh, to think about it. So this establishes um, a relation of fundamental, again, ontological, what something is, right? Ontological classification. Remember, predication has to do with classification, ordering, right? Appropriately, based on the, uh, the appropriateness of whatever you're trying to order. So, um, <clears throat> okay. We can sort of have bullet points, I guess. One, two, three. Uh, to rewrite it another way, this is a relation between a kind, you know, a specific kind of a general, a kind, like for example, Homo sapiens, or animals or um, color, right? And a specific thing that falls within this. You can think about it in terms of sets as well. A set is a, the set of all human beings, right? Includes the individual human beings within. This is a relation. Between a thing between a kind and a thing that falls under it. I'm sorry, Arto, but on, on the first part of three, what kind of a relationship are you saying that establishes? The first part of no, three. No, 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 and three. This is a, no, down here, three. What, this? This is a relation. In other words, this, a set of. Right. I mean, when something is set of another thing. Right, no, I got that. It's the third one I don't understand that you're saying. This one. This, no, third, three. This is a relation. This is a relation between a kind and a thing that falls under it. So in other words, if we oh, do it diagrammatically, oh, 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 it's okay. a relationship between, for example, humans and a, Socrates. You already know that this is the relationship between a primary substance, which is a particular substance, such as Socrates, and a universal, which is human, right? So, <clears throat> four, and we can conclude this sort of overview of this, the set of relation. Four, um, this relationship is a relationship that falls within the same category. In this case, the sameness of the category is that you're talking about human beings in particular, human beings in general. 
So this is a relationship, a set of relationship, when something is set up, establishes a relationship, you're talking about some two things that fall within the same category of things. So you're not talking about a flower and a person. You're not, that, that would be a mismatch. Those would be two different categories of things. Right? You're not talking about you know, uh, color and cheetahs. Those would be two different categories. You're not talking about a human being and a color. Those would be two different categories. But humans are a sub... Uh, humans are a, a sub-genus. Humans exactly. are not a, a sub-genus. So if you say mammals on the planet Earth, yeah. Yeah. And, and you predicate mammals of Socrates, that's an accurate, that's a set of uh, statement. So you're going to have a whole series of sub... You're going to have a whole series of sub -genus. You do. And there are the Aristotelian trees, right, of the different kinds. So, for example, Socrates is an animal. Is that true? Well, it is true. Why? Because Socrates is a two-legged or is a biped or however you want to describe the type of animal that a human being is. But you can't say Socrates is white, for example. Let's say you ask that. And then you can't say, well, what is, is Socrates really what? What is Socrates? Socrates is white. Uh, that would be inaccurate or false in this w way of thinking about it because first of all you're mixing two categories and the last part here that I want to add is that uh, a set of relationship expresses some fundamental essential feature of the subject that you're predicating. So Socrates being white is not the essential is not the essential aspect of that subject. The essential thing is that he's an animal or that he's a human. Whiteness is something that is in Socrates, or maybe, or maybe Socrates spent time at the beach and he became more tanned, changed color, skin color in a certain sense, that does not change the fundamental essence of Socrates as a human being. You cannot change that, right? That's because that's the, what he's trying to differentiate here. In other words, this may seem like a trivial exercise, but to me, this is very important because it allows a certain clarity in differentiating categories of things and meaning. Like, what is more fundamental than something else? I mean, yes, this could have all kinds of political implications, artistic implications, you know, whatever. In other words, you are working on, uh, you're engaged in some kind of a political project and you're trying to capture the essential aspects of some object, some thing, some being, whether it's the economy or whether it's, you know, well, I'm not saying you should apply this mechanically, but he's giving us a window of how when talking about one thing, Socrates, you can describe Socrates in, 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 in his fundamental sort of essential aspect of his being, which is the fact that he's a human type of being, or you can also describe Socrates in, in, in accidental or non-essential aspects. He is a professor, you know, he is a troublemaker, he's a dissident in his society, or, you know, he is Plato's teacher. These are non-essential uh, aspects of Socrates' being. Right? So I think, I think that's pretty useful. To, um, you know, the great painter Malevich, I don't know how the accent is. Malevich? Malevich. Mal 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 yeah. You know, he was a Krasnodar Polish, Polish, Russian, or Ukrainian, I forget now, but it doesn't matter. He was yeah. um, early 20th century, uh, Kazimir Malevich. Yeah, Kazimir. The supporter of the Russian Revolution, you have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Malevich's famous breakthrough in art came with the square, you know, with the white square painting, black square painting. And so he, he produced this painting, which it's in, the, it's in MoMA, one of his paintings, or several of them, I'm sure. Uh, it was basically a white canvas which contained nothing except pure white. Or there was like a black square, there were all these different things. Of course, this caused a scandal. Because they're like, this is not art, this is anti-art. And so they asked Malevich, you know, what is your thinking behind producing the, the white square or the black square paintings? He said, I wanted to get to the most essential aspect of what does it mean to do art? And, and by extension to artists. Like, what, 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 is, what is the most essential task, the most fundamental uh, thing that I'm trying to do as an artist? And he said, I realized that when I go about painting the way I usually paint it, you know, I have my vocabulary as an artist, and I have my, my uh, uh, I'm habituated to do certain types of 
art and not other types of art because I like it or I dislike it. I have this accumulated knowledge of accidentals in Aristotle's language, right? Qualifications, uh, uh, certain quantitative urges, to use Aristotle's language of the categories. I play on certain opposites in my art, right? So he said, is it possible to strip all of that away and reduce my art or this particular piece of art to the most essential thing that the being of, of a piece of art consists in? And he said, this is it. It's the complete negation and absence of all accidentals, for, for example, in Aristotle's language. And that's simply the white piece background on a white canvas or black uh, you know, canvas that's just devoid of anything. And he said, I, I tried to purge my, my soul of all of the baggage that I developed as an artist in order to be able to do art in a new way for me. You know, that's a very, that Aristotle would say, probably, right? He would say, well, um, Malevich sort of executed this kind of successfully for him. He reached the fundamental ontological classification of art in his view, and he found ground zero beyond which he, or from which he could actually start doing art in a new way for himself. Um, so I think that, I always like that story uh, because it, it, I find it very, you know, the point of absolute zero, you know, in art or in music. In music it was John Cage, for example, in a certain type of music, when he wrote four minutes and 33 seconds, it's four minutes and 33 seconds of silence, which is the anti-music. Right, so he, people showed up at the concert. John Cage was a young kind of American experimental composer, was becoming popular in the 40s. He sat down at the piano, and for four minutes and 33 seconds, he played nothing. And it caused a scandal. People got upset, they got nervous, they got anxious, they were <laughs> coughing, you know. Where's the music? What is he doing? Is he crazy, you know? And then he got up, he had a clock, and after four minutes, he, he bowed and he left. And for exactly the same reason. You know, he wanted to find out uh, what is sort of the most fundamental ontological classification, if you will, of what music is in his mind. And that was, uh, he discovered that there is no silence. He tried to find silence as the antithesis of music, organized sound. He said, actually, if you walk into a soundproof chamber, which he did at MIT, he heard his own blood circulating through his cardiovascular system, and he said, there is no silence. Humans cannot experience silence. So that changed uh, his perception of music. So he started doing music that used found objects, like the recordings of traffic, which were incorporated with a piano, or electronically produced sounds that don't exist in nature, mixed with the role of the dice, which determines what kind of music you're going to play. Right. So it had some major consequences. but. It, it wasn't with Aristotle, with Cage, it was more with Zen Buddhism, but, but uh, I, I like this part of the categories because it re reminds me of sort of these two, in my mind, these two applications uh, in art and in music. I don't, I don't, they never made that connection, Malevich never quoted Aristotle, but to my mind, that's how I make sense of these kinds of distinctions that he's going here uh, in this fundamental classification. So I don't know, to me it's funny. Kind of a useful. Um, of course, Malevich's students, to celebrate that their teacher's birthday, painted the entire village he lived in white overnight. <laughs> so when they woke up, everybody in the village lived in white house and white fence, white trees, you know, white grass. Everything was white. They painted people's houses. They painted people's houses without all the Yeah, and they loved it. The local, the, the villagers, yeah, they loved it. it. <laughs> So, just so how would this not be what you're doing, just playing yeah. an aesthetic category? Why would it just be a category? Why would it be a category of aesthetics when you would use uh, Malevich as an example of whiteness or blackness? You know, or, yeah, because, yeah. So why, 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 would, why would it be a fundamental category and not just an aesthetic category? And just, I mean, that's yeah. a good question. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. Okay. I don't I'm just, know. just yeah. wondering. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Nathan has the answer. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I, I, no, it's more of a question instead of an answer. Uh, I think uh, uh, I agree that the Maradish is a very good example to sort of uh, uh, illustrate the the sort of fundamental uh, to 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 bring up the problematic of the. 
kind of the possibility of, of uh, making art. Uh, so maybe another way of fra phrasing it is the framing of art itself. So, so white on white is a... Uh, a uh, uh, I opened a can of worms because it's true. <laughs> I mean, it could just be an aesthetic conversation, which is a totally different well, branch of fundamental philosophy. Uh, yeah. well, I, like worms, so. I improvised, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Don't bring up Marx again. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a huge topic, you're right. Uh, a bring, a bring forth uh, of framing itself, um, and uh, and I think. Um, you know, but during the time that he, he made that breakthrough, um, he was not alone because the, the sort of Victorian traditional uh, universe was collapsing with uh, atonal music and with theory of relativity. Uh, you know what Einstein said about relativity, right? I just read this quote. He said, now that mathematicians have entered the theory of relativity, I don't understand you don't myself. Understand <laughs> Um, but then again, uh, I think at, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, as opposed to white and white, would be Kubes, the origin of the world, where what was traditionally sublimated, what was traditionally disavowed and represented, was brought forth right in front of you, that, that obscene, erect body uh, that's just all there is. I think it's very beautiful. I don't think it's beautiful <laughs> at all. Uh, Look, I actually well, have I, a I, I, invitation. I, I'm you seeing know, in, in sort of a, you know, in, in, a, in a very violent, uh, obtrusive way yeah. that, that, yeah. that's, a, that's more close to the disclosure of being, if you yeah. will. Than, I mean, I think there's definitely, I mean, I, yes, I, I, it was just a provocation, but to me, the way I was reading this kind of uh, metaphor, if you will, of the Malevich white square. Yeah, yeah. To me, it's sort of, this, yeah. from the point of view of Malevich, in other words, uh, how do we get, I mean, Aristotle is mapping out uh, a hierarchy of, of relations, some of which are more important than others, if you want to try to establish relations between beings. And in that sense, this does this, I mean, in the field of aesthetics, I think it could definitely be read this way, but given the close integration of Malevich's art to his very being, uh, probably somewhere in his mind there was some kind of an inner classification search of the fundamental relation for, in his own way. But I'm not sure. Of course, to end this on a joke, a friend of mine also, when, every time I mention Malevich, a friend of mine says, who's Austrian, he says, well, you know what the battle flag of the Italian Navy was in World War II? What? White flag and a white background, yeah. <laughs> which is, of course, the flag of surrender. But on the other hand, maybe the Italians were smart to surrender and didn't actually survive, you know, so I don't know. We did black on black, too, for the black Russians, not only for the white Russians. Yeah, yeah. Somebody said white you know, red on red. The Origin of the World? Who was the owner of the Origin of the World? Lacan. Jean Lacan. He only hid it from the Nazis. Yeah. So I just want to add one more thing on this first fundamental relation, the set of relation, and it's important, is that what is said of a subject is essential to that subject, okay? Or says something essential about that subject. So when we say that Socrates is human, we're saying something that's, in, that's fundamentally the most important thing that's true about Socrates ontologically, that above all and before anything else, he's human, right? So, um, so what is said of a subject is essential to the subject. Okay, so then we can move on just, just so we can get to... Uh, can I just ask one like, question? Yeah. Um, so like, I, I, would it, let's say like Socrates is a philosopher or like Socrates is very intelligent be like as relevant because without those things he's not like specifically Socrates like he's still a man uh, well then you can say then you can do the combinations for example you can say something is said of Socrates and it's also in Socrates mm -hmm. or not in Socrates right and then you can become sort of like Socrates is very intelligent because he possesses knowledge that's very wide. That that is no longer said of. That okay, belongs in the category. Like that's fundamental. Right, but but that's also important, and that's why there are two of them. There's said of and 
and, and present in. So when, when you do both, when you say something of Socrates or not, uh, and then when you say something is also present in Socrates or not, you have a full, you capture the full complexity of that human being, right? Or of that color, or of that uh, physical, or of that physical body, you know, or, or whatever the case might be, you know. That's why there are two. But it's interesting that there are no four, there's two. And I was like, damn it, how can you reduce it to these fundamental triads and dyads? I mean, that's very difficult if you think about it, right? There are no 14 fundamental relations, there are two in Aristotle. I mean, at this stage, later they become 10. You know, later in the metaphysics, things become more complicated. But, but um, um, okay, so then let's just do the present in a subject and then move on. Uh, present. In and present, so of course, just a few examples of set up. Man is said of Socrates because that's how Socrates, Plato, Aristotle writes, right? Man is said of. So, for example, I think you don't. Want, do you want to have up there a B rather than two to be consistent? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I appreciate that. Is it four B or it's Roman good. numeral two? <laughs> Is it 4B or is it Roman it's Roman, numeral it's, it's 2? It's letter B. Yeah. Yeah. It's the letter B. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's, it's part it's, of it's good. It's important to classify that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so examples of set of, right, that Aristotle gives are man is said of Socrates. But of course we can read it in reverse to, for our English today, right? Socrates is a man. That becomes sort of like the colloquial version. Uh, you can say animal is said of man. Now that's an interesting example. Uh, man or human being is an animal, right? Uh, in other words, it doesn't just have to be the particular, it can also be sort of the relationship between two universals. Uh, white is said of this particular color. This color on the back of this jacket is black. <coughs> right? That's the same set of relationship. Or color is said of white. White is a color. These are all set of uh, uh, statements that describe something that's essentially fundamentally true about the subject that they describe, that the predicate describes, or informs, or, or you know. Um, <clears throat> one, present in relations, these are, this is a relation of dependency. Uh, it is cross-categorical. And it's not essential, but the word that Aristotle uses is it's accidental. It doesn't have to be there all the time, or at all, right? It's not part of its essential be uh, being. It's an essential part of, of its being. So, it is something that is not essential, but rather uh, <coughs> accidental. Examples, uh, you know, he says this, that this grammatical knowledge is present in a soul. Socrates knows a lot about grammar is very knowledgeable about grammar. In other words, yes, the subject is Socrates, but what does the predicate do? Is knowledgeable about grammar, or, or speaks several languages. It, it established a relationship, right, across categories, knowledge and human being, right? And it says something about Socrates that's not the essential truth about Socrates. Somebody might say, well, I don't think Socrates is knowledgeable enough, or as much as he thinks he is. So we should sentence him to death. Or he's too knowledgeable and we should let him go. Um, right? But nobody can say, no, I don't think Socrates is a human being. That would make no sense. That would be false. Right? In that sense. Uh, color is present in a body. Uh, this rock is white. This is a rock. It's a type of uh, a natural object. With, with certain properties, minerals, or it's produced by, you know, whatever, however rocks are produced, I forget now. It's the millennia-long process of 
the compacting of what? Of trees or of soil? I forget how, magma, lava, whatever the case might be. But it just so happens that this particular rock has, the, has the, also the additional property of being white. But that whiteness might change over time, right? It may change color when subjected to heat or rain or whatever the case might be. But that still may not change the fundamental property of, of that object, of that thing, that being called rock. And to move on, is this clear? Okay, to move on, um, there's no board space. You know, it's interesting, the boards are not used for writing, they're used for, this is like a new pedagogical thing, it's used for post-it notes that you write on, but you don't write on the board. <laughs> yeah, it's, this is like Facebook. Uh, Why? It's like Facebook. <laughs> it's, like Facebook. <laughs> it's like Facebook. Uh, it's true. You see, they, they write on the paper, but they don't write on the board. They write on the board. I just noticed this, it's kind of fascinating. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt the workspace of the teachers. So maybe I can just <sighs> temporarily just sort of move this here. I put it over to the United States. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you put it over Mexico and South America. Lisa. But then there's a funny thing, it says here New York City, and it points this Don't way yeah. to the Don't American Samoa or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just one other piece. Um, now, he doesn't say this in the categories, he says it in the metaphysics, where he defines the universal and the particular. So I want to add this just because historically, what I'm building towards here is the famous square consisting of four parts which was the contribution of the Neoplatonic philosopher Porfiry, an interesting character from current-day Lebanon, who was a major interpreter of Aristotle in the early, kind of late antiquity, and he kind of systematized a lot of these uh, interpretations of the, of, of the categories. What was his name? Porfiry. I don't know how you say it, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but... Porfiry, yeah. Porfiry, yeah. in English, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> It was a Greek, one of those living in those city-states that had remained from the ancient times along the coast of the Lebanese coast. Today would be the Lebanese coast. There was a Roman city of Tyre. I don't know how you say it. Tyre, which has the sur the biggest surviving uh, racetrack, hippodrome, <laughs> for horse races in the Roman times. The Romans gave us great stadiums, but. They don't have a philosopher in the class of Aristotle. It's interesting. Second order thinkers. We don't care about that. Maybe third. <laughs> third order. We don't care about Roman philosophy. They did, they did develop imperialism. Though. But they did develop imperialism <laughs> then. Yes. So here we can add under number Roman numeral two to move on with this classification. Something that is a universal. is something that is said of some object. <laughs> is what is said of uh, some subject. What is particular So we have, now we have the beginnings in Western philosophy of the, another fundamental distinction on top of um, sort of these ways of fundamentally classifying things that are more true than other things or, or more truthfully true than other things or more important. Now we have the, the other major division, conceptual uh, sort of um, breakthrough of attempts to describe as accurately as possible, if you will, um, the notions of a universal and a particular, another type of the fundamental division, right, between uh, sub beings. Um, and this is, of course, in a sense, the negation of this. In particular, is something, but that's a Hegelian word, so that's not good to do. You don't want to mix uh, words of one philosopher with, that's actually very bad. <laughs> particular is what is something. that is not <coughs> said of a 
particular subject. And here at this point, just to continue, um, some examples. I guess I'll just erase this part. Can I erase this part? I can erase this part. Yeah. Are you using the term particular in the search of, in the sense of individual or in the sense of opposite of universal? In the sense of the individual. Yeah. Okay. In fact, some people translate it as individual, some people call it the particular. But it's not in the Hegelian sense. When Hegel, there is the singular, in the latest English translation, uh, they use the word singular, or in the older translation, the translation I think was the individual. And then there is the particular and the universal. So in the Hegel, Hegelian system, it's a triad. And here in Aristotle, we have a dyad. You know, it's the singular and the universal. Uh, but we still have a triad in the species genera. You know. So, example. Sure. Yeah. The Greek word for um, for universal is katalon. I think we went through this. You know, for which the word catalog comes from. Yeah. K a t a. L O M, and uh, you know, when you do the uh, alliteration in English. So, in other words, the universal catalog. is the exhaustive right. catalog right. of 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 uh, of individual things of that particular being. So, in other words, the universal that applies to us is humans or men, as they say here, right? Why? Because that descriptor captures every single individual human being. Right? simply becomes an instance of that larger catalog of human beings. So the universal is the, la is the large, I don't want to use the word set because that's not what Aristotle was doing and that's a modern kind of 19th century mathematical notion, but people have used, you know, you can say like if this circle represents uh, humankind or human beings in general, all the seven point whatever billion humans that exist right now, this is the universal category. Of, as it applies to human beings, and then the individual, or the particular in Aristotle's language here, would be that each individual uh, human being consisting of those, you know, multiplied, added seven billion times. Right? So the particular is, the, is each little dot, which has a name, Socrates, Arto, Alita, Phil. We are individuals, particulars. But we also belong to the universal category of human beings, because both describe accurately who we are. But one, of course, is more fundamentally important than the other. It's the, it's the particular for Aristotle. Okay? Um, okay. So examples of universals include in his, right, he says he uses man as a universal. Um, animal. You know, color. Examples of particular. Would you say that they that the individuals were members yeah. of your universe? If you want to use the, the modern kind and of set theory. You don't see that as a conflict with uh, Aristotle's comment uh, that that uh, that uh, that when you're talking about a substance, you're not talking about a substance having parts. Well, the most fundamental substance, which is Chapter Five, is a particular that is not set up and is not in anything. And that's a particular, for example, an example would be you. You are a primary substance. You are primary. We are all primary substances as individual beings, right? Uh, so so, so it, that's sort of where, where he goes with this. He's prioritizing human beings. I mean, this is a materialist, right? He's prioritizing um, human beings and our relations that we establish with other humans, with nature so you don't itself. See members of a universal as being a part of the universal. Say again? That you are not envisaging human beings as being a part of a universal. You think a part is something different. No. Individual, so in other words, particular human beings, right? I understand are, that we're talking about subject, and I understand Aristotle's co comment was, uh, was related to substance and sub substance. Yes, so in other words, particular human beings are also 
simultaneously members of this larger grouping, the universal. Yeah, I'm so, asking a more generic question, but I'll talk, I'll ask you later. Okay. Right. Is it possible to extend man animal color to something like stardust, or is that kind of stuff? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> Ziggy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if he was aware of, of uh, sort of some of the ideas that have been produced by human thought since his time, he probably would extend notions of, to that. I don't know. Probably. Uh, what are you thinking? You're thinking? I don't know. Just can it go as far as this sort of new age logic of you know, cosmos? I know there's a new branch of sort of a new philosophy called new, materi new materialism. New materialism. I'm not aware there. of it. I haven't read it yet, so I don't know yeah. what. I know there's also post humanism, which is a current that's big uh, in some big names. Yeah. Like Donna Haraway works in post humanism, developing that, but I'm not, I don't know what, what, it, stand, what it means. What it stands for. I haven't gotten a chance to. Uh, there was another branch of philosophy that, that deals with objects. Uh, the universe, object uh, oriented, object -oriented yeah. yeah. Or yeah, I mean, could it go Spinoza, like man, animal, color, nature? Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, Aristotle was saying that though, right? He's oh, you mean above genera and above yes. above, above genera. I'm asking um, what prevents Aristotle's thinking from going to that point. Actually, that's what I'm rather. Sure. I'm gonna guess in my in yes. my sense, I think why Aristotle stops at the level at the third level because remember in. Uh, in one of the books, I think it's, it's chapter 3 and 4 and 5, he makes the point that some substances are more fundamental than others, right? And he says, whatever the, the thing, whatever the, the level closest to the particular is, is more meaningful to us, right? Once you get too far out, like beyond genera, this is what he's implying, I think, mm. you are confronted with things that are not really meaningful to us. For example, on the scale of the universe, or on the scale of the planet itself as a body, right? Mm. Of which genera and species and differential are, are parts of. He probably would say, well, I don't get any special meaning by extending the scale beyond genera, because it's becoming more and more universal in the world, and at that point it doesn't make sense to humans. Right? So in other words, it makes no sense very little sense to say, I'm a child of the universe. <laughs> For him. Now, if somebody is a Zen Buddhist, or if there's some other conception, yoga, you know, conceptions, they would say, well, maybe they would have a different kind of an approach. But Spinoza might disagree. Well. Or Spinoza would disagree, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because Spinoza defines God as energy that permeates everything. Right? right? So he was already thinking on, on, exactly. on that level. And it's all attributes, like it's all rivulets. Yeah. yeah. But Sp anyway. Sp Spinoza was another master, you know, thinker. Right, right, right. You know, fiendishly difficult thinker, you know, the ethics. I think there's a, Michael, didn't you say there's, an, there's a study group studying the ethics in France that's been going on for 56 years? At least. Yeah. Hey, so what you're wow. really saying in your examples is you're allowing <laughs> subcategories of universals. Yes. There are subcategories of universals. Okay. The species and the genera are universals. Right? The particular only exists on the level on, on, on the one most immediate level. The others are levels of universals, one of which is closer to the particular than the other, even though they're both universals. This is what people don't like about Aristotle because it doesn't seem very logically strict, but it's not just logic. Logic here means ontology. So it's a, it's a layers of meaning. Something can be more meaningful and, and closer to your particular being that's a universal than some other universal being yeah. that's which I, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's, I think that's one of the beautiful <laughs> formulations that we have here. Um, so what is a particular, examples of particular? Uh, Socrates. Or I used to have a greyhound called Schizza. So Schizza the greyhound, that's a particular uh, being. Uh, this, the moment you qualify, the moment you establish limits, for example, this, um, white thing, you know, is a color. Now, I just want to do the Porphyrian square because it would be irresponsible if we don't do it. Because it nicely summarizes uh, what we talked about. And I think it's useful 
Let's do it. Actually, let's do it down here. More space. Let me erase this. Please don't erase. Oh wait. Oh. oh, sorry. Socrates. Yeah, Socrates. <laughs> You know, we want Skeeta, the, uh, the, the, the Greyhound. <laughs> uh, amazing creature. Yes. With elegance and beauty. Great film title for a Sundance independent yeah. film. <laughs> or a band. Yes, a Greyhound. I do have a new band, by the way, I want to announce. The first yeah. album is going to, after a 12 year hiatus in music, it's called Goose Motor. Yeah. Good. So right. we're in that silly mode. But. <laughs> <laughs> has a goose on them. <laughs> what do you play? Oh, I play this synthesizer called the Hawking Continuum, but I'll let you, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely, uh, I don't think we're going to make many, we're going to sell many, <laughs> but we'll, it's for the soul. Yeah. So historically, when people talk about the categories, they do have some version of this Porphyrian square, which summarizes everything, in the order that Aristotle mentions them, and this is in the reading, this is book two, for example. This is book two, uh, 1A20, sec, you know, paragraph 1A20. And Aristotle has these letters, A, B, C, and D. And these are the four possible permutations of, uh, of said of, not said of, present in, not present in. Right? And it, it, it's, it's a nice, uh, okay, so this would be letter A in Aristotle's text which is said of a subject, not present in a subject. So this is one possibility. Something could be said of an object or subject, but not be present in it. And here we're talking about universal Universal because we're saying something of universal substances. Ah, this square is not big enough. Okay, let me just make it bigger so we can actually do this properly. I'm trying to make the square proper. <laughs> so this is project. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Too sango. It's a what? It's like the socialist project. To you make a square? Yeah, you have to erase it. You have to erase a square. <laughs> Command didactic, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That category of redness. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> so letter A said of a subject. So the first possibility, and we can read Aristotle's text in a second, not present in the subject. I wish I had a different color marker, but that's okay. Uh, this is a universal, this describes a being, it's a universal substance. If we go to the text of chapter 2, this is kind of in a cryptic form, uh, page, you know, uh, four, one, eight, twenty. Of things there are, letter A, some are said of a subject, but are not in any subject. For example, man is said of a subject, the individual man. So how do we translate that? Socrates is a man, but is not in any subject. It's, when you say Socrates is a man, uh, Socrates is not, you know, the predication to the subject does not place the predication in the subject. It simply says something of Socrates, that he's a man. And then we go on. Uh, letter B. We can do it diagonally. Something can be not said of a subject. But be present in. So you see here, these are just the permutations that he's going to, present in a subject. Remember when we said when something is present in a subject, it is some kind of an accidental feature to it. It's not essential. 
Um, and because it's not essential, it's not a substance. It's just a non-substance. So for example, if Socrates is white, that indicates this kind of a presentation. Okay, what? Something that's in, present in Socrates, but that's not, a, that's not an essential thing that you're saying about Socrates. That's an accidental thing. He happens to be white today. Maybe, some, maybe it's snowed on him or something. Or it's November and he's far away. I, I don't know. He, but Aristotle uses these examples with, with whiteness and so on and so forth. This is a universal. Sorry, this is a particular. Because it's not set up. This is a particular non substance being. Predication. The square is still not perfect, it's too small again. But it's okay, we keep improving our square. Yeah, keep purging. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It should be a joke. The examples that Aristotle gives, I wish I had a blue marker, but I think these are permanent. The examples that he gives in letter B, he talks about this knowledge of grammar. <coughs> this particular knowledge of grammar, in other words. Or this white particular color in the body, right? In the body. Yeah. That's why it's present in. Right. Right? This body is white. Right. It's a human body, or it's a cheetah, but it now has acquired the color white as an accidental thing that happened to it. Um, letter C. And that's the accidental. Yes. In other words, he's saying, look. As you start talking to each other about things, human language, human way of making sense of the world is going to basically express any possible meaning through the combination of these four things. Right. Uh, so this, it's going to be expressed in one of these four permutations of things. You're going to be either saying something, you're going to be describing something that's universal substance, you're going to be describing universal accidental non substance, you're going to be talking about an individual substance or an individual non substance. And that should account for all. Uh, possible uh, sort of things that you may want to express about being. And, and generally speaking, it's the dialectical tension between substance and accident. And of course, it's already it's starting to have all these tensions between yeah. substance and non-substance. Yeah. Universal, individual. And the accidental. Right? Right. And yeah. The accidental and the essential. That's, that's the opposite right. of the accidental. That's always there and can never change. It can never be removed right. for that being to continue to be what it is. So there's multiple levels of dialectical tension are established in this chart already. You need about 2,400 years to, to unpack all of this, or at least Hegel's major introduction. Uh, well, and, and, and Descartes in the discourse. So 2,000 years. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because he engages the whole question of yeah. substance and accidents in the, yeah. in the first uh, the discourse on the method and the rules for the direction of mind. That's another great thinker that yeah. we should probably yeah, yeah. discuss yeah. in a class. Said on a subject, C, letter C in the reading, uh, present in subject. So it's set up, so we're describing some kind of a universal. Uh, and because it's present in, it's an accidental. And the accidentals are non-substances. Like, for example, color white, or the temperature hot, or cold, or... So, accidental, non-substance. Again, we don't care about the details here, because our goal is not to master the categories with examples. We just want to highlight these tensions. Universal, particular. Accidental, essential. Okay, because these are the things that we're gonna we're gonna play with with we're gonna encounter with Hegel, and then the concept of the negation and the negation of the negation as the movement and the spiral of things that happen on multiple levels, and this is sort of where uh, dialectical thought uh, develops, materialist dialectics. What do you have under accidental? No, no, down there. Yeah. Accidental non-substance. Okay. Uh, 
For example, he gives the example of knowledge itself is a universal knowledge. To know something about something that's knowable, right? That's a universal thing. You can, of course, particularize it. Grammatical knowledge. This is a particular instance of the universal thing called knowledge. Um, the color white in general. I almost want to say out of context. Right? You can think of universals as sort of things that are there out of context. And in that sense, they're not useful to people. This is why he's prioritizing the particular. It makes no sense to, to speak of knowledge in general without particularizing it. But you can't particularize something that doesn't exist as a universal. Right? So these are the things that Aristotle is, is capturing. Um, you know, like when people, when, when in common everyday speech, people might say things like, they might express universal sentiments, like, the economy in general. And you're like, what do you mean? That makes no sense. What do you mean the economy in general? We can't comprehend the economy in general. That makes no sense to us. You have to particularize it if you want to make sense of it. But the fact that you can particularize it means that it already exists as a universal. And vice versa. So when you say this is a, something essential, in the bottom right corner, is correct as essential? Is that right? Uh, for something to be essential, it has to be set up. Yes, so, so, so this is saying something that is particular, it's not, but it's essential. Yes. So when we say essential, we're saying that like, um, it's essential that there be light in this room for you to conduct this, this discussion. That's an accidental. That's an yeah. um, because the light could be dim, or it could be a well-lit room, or it could be a, a room that's partially lit. But the essential thing would be something like uh, uh, something that is set up. So that, let's, we always have to go back to examples like, for example, you as a subject, or let's say a cat as a subject, or like what would be the most essential thing that's true about you? That if it weren't true, you would cease to be you. But if you had made a three by three matrix instead of a two by two matrix, and if <laughs> if you had then labeled the rows and the columns, then that would have been self-evident from the beginning. It is possible to improve on Porphyry. That's true. That's true. I just never went that way. I, I didn't want to enter the. <laughs> Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry, but you're saying if it's not set of a subject, it's not essential, right? Is that correct? <laughs> if it's present in a subject, it's not essential? Yeah, I think I'm, I confused myself too. Let me, let, me, let me sort of regain my thoughts here. Um, an, essential, an essential relation is a relation that is set of okay. something, right? An, an accidental or non-essential relation is something that is present in something. Well, that's actually accidental. Right, I think you yes. B is accidental, correct? Yes. And A is essential, right? A at the top left. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. And we have one more. We have letter D, not set of a subject. <coughs> and this is, of course, the most important one. Right? Not set of a subject, for Aristotle. Not set of a subject. and not present in the subject. Whoa. <laughs> not present. It sounds weird. What happened? No, no, it's, um, it's nothing there. It sounds like death. It yeah. sounds like the void, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is, of course, a primary <laughs> substance. This is us, as human beings, that are actualized, that have an actual persona and a, and a you know, the, the, the borders that create you as a particular human being, which is Aristotle's fundamental category of analysis, and the, the point of interest in his thought is um, a being for whom things are not set up, and a being that is not present, for something that is not present in that subject. Right? So this becomes the primary substance of chapter five. It's very counterintuitive in a certain sense. That something that sounds like a void, I mean, it, it, immediately, because everything is a not, 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 then what is, what am I, <laughs> you know? Am I just a, 
Um, okay, so now let's go through the text a little bit and just read through some of these things. Um, letter D, for example. Some are neither in a subject nor set of a subject. For example, the individual man or individual horse. For nothing of this sort is either in a subject or set of a subject. So, for example, Socrates is a human being. You can't say, you can't predicate human being by using Socrates. You can't say hu human, humans are Socrates. It doesn't make sense, right? Um, so, so this is sort of where he's, he's going in establishing the primacy of that category, the particular, over the universal. Because that allows us to speak and describe things meaningfully. Right? Otherwise, you're saying nonsense. Human beings is Socrates. Or human beings, humans are Socrates. That makes no sense. But the inverse, the movement from the, the subject, which is a particular, that some predicate says something of, right, actually makes sense. You know, uh, Michael is a philosopher. So we're predicating philosopher. We're saying that of Michael. That's true. Right? It can be verified. Empirically, qualitatively, and using some other categories too. But we can't say human beings are Michael. You can't predicate human beings by using Michael, by saying of Michael of them. Um, so let's just move on. Chapter 3, there's a very interesting um, anticipation of the syllogism, of the actual logic, which is, has three parts. So if you read the paragraph 1b10, beginning of chapter 10, we read, whenever one thing is predicated of another as of a subject, all things said of what is predicated will be said of the subject also. For example, man is predicated of the individual man. Let's do this. Let's rewrite it to, to make it clearer, because you're going to see this interesting logic kind of emerging from these concepts. Um, truth tables, if you will, or truth, 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 um, Consequences that are linked. And if you follow the chain link of a thought, you produce something that you say, well, of course, this is unquestionably true. Um, so, for example, 1B10. Man is predicated of the individual man. So, okay. So, let's pick an individual man. So, Socrates is a man. Let's call this one. Sentence number one. This is how the syllogism is going to be deployed. Right? In the prior analytics. So he's, 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 Aristotle must have been a great teacher, too, pedagogically speaking, because these are his lecture notes, and you can almost see a preparation of the later book. Step by step, he's sort of introducing ideas innocently without fully describing what he's doing, in a sense. Right? And then by the time you read this again in the prior analytics, you're like, oh, we already saw this. Right? So there's a great pedagogical methodology here, starting from the simple sentences, easy to understand. You know, what are synonyms, you know, you know, and then now we're building a, a page later, you know, a page later <laughs> requires 2,000 years of thinking to fully reach the potential indicated in these two pages. I mean, it's kind of extraordinary. So Socrates is a man. Where do we see this? We see this in this example that he gives on 1B10 where he says, man is, pre man is predicated of an individual man. So in other words, right? This is the, the predication movement that's happening here. Man is predicated of an individual man. Socrates is a man. Okay. Then, and then animal is predicated of man. So, man, man singular is an animal. Right? That's what he's saying here. Second part of that sentence. An animal is predicated of man. Okay? So this is the second sentence. Socrates is a man. Now notice, then he takes the predicate and shifts it here as a subject. Okay? In the second sentence. Man is an animal. Is this true? Literally. Until it, as far as human beings have meaning to these words, yes, we are an animal. We're a type of animal. Thus, number three, so, so, i.e. necessarily, the following will be true. 
animal will be predicated of the individual man as well. For the individual man is both a man and an animal. And this is the syllogism in embryonic form. Okay? So thus, let's do the final predication. Um, Socrates. Right? Does the individual man, if, if, if we replace the individual man with the name Socrates, we can use the same thing here. The Socrates is also an animal. Why? Because Socrates is a man. We already said that. And because man is also an animal, thus Socrates is, I guess it, I think in math this call or in later logic this call a transitive properties. If A is B and B is C, then A is C. But for us, the interesting things happen with what happens with the position of the predicate and the subject as we shift in, 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 uh, in meaning. So here the subject is this, and the predicate is this. Now the predicate here functions as, as the subject, and there's a new predicate introduced. Then we return to Socrates as the subject, and then now the predicate, uh, right? So there's interesting movements that create the then. So in a sense, uh, the man is the sort of the media, me, mediating term exactly. of so two larger moments, uh, and also uh, the, uh, there's, a there's a repetition uh, of the you are, itself. You, you're pointing our attention to another important thing that, by the way, Aristotle has implied here, which will become fundamentally important, the concept of mediation. Okay? So, so in other words, this introduces a mediating term which exists in the first two sentences but is not present in the conclusion, but makes the conclusion possible. So this in Hegel becomes rewritten also in Aristotle. Aristotle later uses SMP, uh, subject, predicate, medium, or, or intermediary. This later in, 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 in Hegel assumes different letters, universal, particular, uh, uh, singular, in different permutations where each of the letters can function as a subject or predicate or, or mediator. This is Marx's capital volume two, the circulation, the various uh, technical analysis of uh, the circulation of capital in different circuits. Okay? Uh, it uses the concept of mediation within the, the, the dialectical logic, which handles, uh, enables the resolution and the overcoming and the transcendence of contradictory sentences of meaning. In Aristotle, A and not A, that's a, you cannot surmount or overcome that kind of a uh, logical contradiction, right? With Hegel, you can. But here we have the, 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 the syllogism, the notion of mediation, already presented accidentally, without really saying much about it in embryonic form. Right? So, so this is why you have to talk about subjects and predicates in order to get to this point, right? as, as an intermediary stage in his analysis. Hmm. By the way, again, I'm going to mention this as a provocation for people who want to do work, uh, interesting work today in political theory or political philosophy. I hate the word political theory. It makes no sense. Political philosophy, right? Or praxis. Um, do we have media? Can we study contemporary society through a Hegelian or Marxian triad, are there, what are the mediators in the political? What are the mediators in the political today, if there are any? Uh, they, that has not, that's sort of like an unfinished area of, 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 uh, of, of political philosophy that maybe because it, it doesn't function that way, or maybe we just haven't con continued the line of thinking from Hegel through Marx it, using the, my materialist dialectical logic. Isn't it... Um it's, I think it's the traditional, uh, dis the disappearance of traditional mediation that, that uh, engenders uh, pure evil, as in violence that has no, no ideological uh, uh, I don't know. pretension, so, so, so uh, a public a display of violence in, in public, mass shooting, uh, uh, and in, in uh, 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 there are... Uh, Just a point, 
I, just to add to what you're saying before, because you made me think about this. Um, remember, in order to identify mediators, we haven't really talked much about that because Hegel kind of tries to identify how to look for mediators. We have to sort of identify, um, uh, at least on this level, these subject predicate relations in some kind of an ontology. It's kind of crazy to think about capital and the formulas, you know, MCC plus or MCN prime as sort of reworked versions of the universal particular and the singular, which are themselves reworked versions of subject, mediator, predicate relations. That's extraordinary insight, right? To be able to do that kind of, um, uh, I don't want to use the word reduction, but extraction, distillation, uh, which actually has an explanatory power in everyday life. Well, we would rather say it's a repetition, a repetition of, 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 the, of the classical Zeitism. Perhaps. I mean, there, there, in, in 20th century philosophy, Deleuze wrote a book, Difference and Repetition, which is not a Hegelian. Uh, he does not engage with Hegel in, explicitly, but uh, the concept of difference and repetition. I mean, all these ideas become more rich, I think, once we confront them with, for example, uh, dialectical logic, you know. But dialectical logic is difficult because we don't have many examples of it in practice. We have this, which is the first version. We have Hegel, which is the second version. And then we have Marx, which is the third version. And then that stops in the middle of the 19th century. And then since then, we don't have examples of dialectical logic explicitly deployed in political analysis. We have it in, economic, in the critique of political economy in the Marxist tradition, mm -hmm. uh, or non-Marxist economists who are critical of Marxist economists knew it, like Schumpeter and all these great economists, they studied Marx, uh, Capital Volume 2. But Hegel's system, uh, is it still relevant? Is it still usable in its explanatory power uh, today? That's a big question. That's a very good question applied to politics, for example. Right. I'm interested in something like that, but I, I am not. I have nothing to report of value. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't, nothing. Wouldn't you have people that read all too sad the ethics to before they read the politics? If they read the what? Have they read the the ethics before they read the politics? Of Aristotle's? Yeah. I think so. I mean, but I, I think they should first read the. Yeah, no, I'm not arguing on that. But you just mentioned the politics. Yes. And I guess I would have mentioned well, the yeah, ethics. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the ethics has uh, the mediation working in the doctrine of the mean. Exactly. I mean, How should one live life the best? Yeah, yeah. The life of moderation, yeah. which at times requires uh, yeah. uh, extreme behavior on the edges. Yeah. You know. uh, in the politics of Aristotle, there are examples of the categories when he describes different existing societies, and he says some are differentiated qualitatively. They have more people than others. They're larger. Others are larger in size, territory, than others. What are the consequences of that, right? So there's all kinds of applications of, of what Aristotle calls, or what is the organon. In other words, it's the collected methodology that we use to think through politics, or ethics, or political economy, or whatever. But you have to have some kind of a methodological grounding. In Heidegger's case, because we taught a class in Heidegger, it wasn't dialectical logic, it was the hermeneutical, I mean, it was his reversion, rewriting of phenomenology, right? That he inherited from Husserl. In, um, uh, in um, I'm trying to think, in, in Freud, there's another method, right, at work. In Nietzsche, there's another organa at work. Uh, in Marx, in Hegel, there's a dialectical logic at work, starting from Aristotle. So there's. So this is, you know, what Hegel refers to in the phenomenology as the instrument. Mm -hmm. We were reading last night the instrument. The instrument. Knowing is the organon. Yeah. You know, we, we, well, or in 20th century yeah. politics, like in 20th century post World War II, um, governing, you know, sort of state power, you know, whether it's the United States or the Soviet Union, there's systems theory, right? Which was a sort of a certain type of positivist instrument that was used to make sense of economic data, war, you know, how to fight war. It became, you know, in Vietnam and even up until today, it became very much of a, sort of this very complicated optimization problem, you know. Uh, at the height of the Vietnam War, I don't know if it's true, but uh, all these reports that the U.S. 
uh, Secretary of Defense, McNamara was obsessed over body counts, you know, qualitative and quantitative measurements, which were going to be used to uh, uh, determine whether you're winning a war or not, right? That's, a, that's an organon too. It's a different kind of an organon. It's a positivist organon, right? It's a different kind of... Uh, in fact, one of the greatest papers that we will not get to this semester... The organon semester, of operationalism. Operationalism, yeah. Large businesses, governments today uh, have this logic. Uh, one of the papers that we, we, we're not going to get to today, but probably next semester, I, I do want to read together with you, uh, Karl Popper um, wrote a very critical, a long critical essay, uh, sort of s subjecting dialectical logic to critique, Hegel and Marx specifically. And he said, this doesn't really make sense, it's obsolete, right? Um, the best counter popper that I've read is from a major but very obscure Soviet thinker, philosopher by the name of, who died in the early 2000s, by the friend of Ilenkov, same school, by the name of Vladimir Bibler. Bibler, Bibler wrote a major paper, which is not translated in English, that paragraph by paragraph shows that Popper doesn't understand Aristotle or Hegel or Marx. He doesn't understand what's happening here, and thus makes gross misrepresentations of what dialectics is, dialectical logic is, and thus it's nonsense because he's overlaying. You know, when you read something, you have to kind of understand the language that the the person that you're trying to critique is using. And Popper did not understand the language, which is a very common mistake when somebody says, you know, the latest example I hear is Zizek debating. Uh, What's that Canadian guy who was very popular? Peterson. Yeah. Peterson. And it is clear when Peterson stands up to criticize the Communist Manifesto, yeah. he has no idea of Marx's uh, theoretical framework. That's true. Right? And then Zizek basically very politely, and also Richard Spencer, the uh, alt-right you know, theorist, who took Zizek's side, says Peterson is, 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 is a joke because he is reading Marx using overlaying a completely different framework, intellectual framework, and thus what he gets out of Marx is nonsense. Richard Spencer commented on that debate. Yeah, sympathetically. That's you should check so it out on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Richard Spencer understands all of this discourse. What? Yeah. Yeah, no, he does. Yeah, he was with Zizek. And you see the comments underneath the old writers are like, wow, I, I didn't know that Zizek was so, made so much sense. Maybe I'm a Marxist in a way, or maybe I'm a Hegelian. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Peterson reads, uh, it, it, Marxist to this too, by the way. Marxists would sort of, for example, you know, Foucault in the 1970s read G Gary Becker, you know, the University of Chicago economist, Nobel Prize. And Foucault read Becker very seriously, right? In other words, he, tried, he understood Becker to the best of his ability on Becker's terms, which is what you have to do in order to critique somebody. You have to understand the organon uh, that Becker is using, the instrument that Becker is using, his intellectual ancestors and his uh, sort of conceptual apparatus in order to understand his argument and then critique it. So Foucault did that. But a lot of people after Foucault who are Marxists dismiss Becker as garbage or a joke or whatever. It's not a joke. You can only say that if you really understand Becker on Becker's terms, you know? Is and organized organi just another word for what we would call conceptual apparatus, what you just said? It's a conceptual apparatus that you think through. That you think through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you deploy on, only when you try to understand something. It's, it's, it's a fundamental aspect of the way you make sense of the it's world. It's the logical instrument of all it's, philosophical things. Exactly. It's your logical instrument. In other words, how do you well, handle yeah, contradictions? Yes. How do you define concepts? How do you read a text? Right? How do you approach grammar? Right. How do you derive, you know, it's this whole thing. Think, think about, think about, I mean, that the organon itself covered everything from topics, interpretation, category, category. formation, right? Rhetoric. Prior logic. Prior, prior, and, and, and logics of analytics. Can there be different organons? Absolutely. Yeah. Heidegger has a right. totally different organon okay. from, okay. Right. from, from right. Hegel, for right. example. Because this was the original organon that was used as, you, you said, conceptual apparatus, but it was the logical apparatus to which so many people, you know, replied to. This, is, this was yes. the historical landmark, if you will, or the, the ground on which everybody thought in the, in the tradition. Aristotle's so organon. the whole medieval, you know, yeah. sense of, uh, of logic that comes out of this. For Duns Scotus, who uh, Bruno Gulli liked so much, the notion of the singular. 
it comes out of this <laughs> thing, rethinking the categories. And By the way, you made an Peter important Spain, point. Spain, I'm sorry, yeah. No, yeah. you made an important point because yeah. some people count yeah. Aristotle's yeah. organon to be basically the categories plus the prior analytics. Right. Uh, More. But More. other people count the interpretations, categories, prior, posterior, metaphysics, all of his texts, right. topics, other topics, than the topics ethics and reflection. Exactly. Yes, as and part reflection. of the organon, exactly. but not the politics right. and the ethics. The politics and the ethics use the organon to arrive at their conclusions. And the treatise on zoology, botany, yes. the scientific work. <laughs> and the, the stars, physics, and stardust. In which I mean, the physics is a great example of you know, the categories really at work. The categories of motion and place. And because of Time. Aristotle's Time. work on physics, right. Isaac Newton, when he was doing right. his physics, directly engages with Aristotle and Galileo and, of course, all the intermediary figures in order to undo their system and impose his organon, which is classical mechanics, you know, uh, as we know it today. Uh, but, but, but that's a very important point. Right. We don't have... It's impossible to write meaningful applied work if you do not have an instrument. If you do rigorous. not have what? An instrument, a rigorous instrument. That's it's right. impossible. You know, like in graduate school, we had methods courses, which was basically statistics, which is important. But I had no other instrument in my training in PhD in political theory. I only had a required statistical class, or what they called qualitative and quantitative analysis, which was not enough. Well, the statistical approach, as uh, Nathan was pointing out, I mean, you know, lacks mediation. You don't really have a theory of mediation. There's no mediation. Yeah. So it's not enough. It. Yeah. It's you, not you enough. You can go through levels of interpretation and statistics, but it doesn't really have a theory of mediation. But you can also, I mean, this is a very fruitful discussion, even though we only mentioned, we haven't even mentioned chapter five, we will, but think about modern physics. You know, you have, again, I'm making a parallel that I haven't rigorously thought about, but a little bit, but you, you have quantum mechanics, which is the level of the very small, the infinitesimally small elementary fundamental particles, right? And they keep finding new ones, and they will find new ones forever, I'm sure. Right? There's, as, as the instruments get more precise, they will find bosons and whatever, yeah. uh, more and more uh, particles that have less and less when mass. When we go into the soundproof, we're going to be able yeah. to hear it. Uh, so quantum yeah. mechanics is the level of subatomic particles, broadly defined, right? That's one level of, of, ma of being, of matter, right? And then you have Einsteinian relativity, which, which studies, and its extensions, which studies extremely large celestial bodies, gravitational forces on the level of solar systems, black holes, you know, Stephen Hawking, so on and so forth. Uh, there must be a level, intermediate level too. And this is where people who try to bridge quantum mechanics with liberal relativity work on it, right? So, so good scientists in physics also work through levels of mediation. I just don't know what the what the mediator of the quantum and, the, and of, of the quantum world way of describing the, the, the universe and the relativity world, way of describing uh, the world is. I'm sure there are. There are these uh, um, uh, levels of mediation. Or maybe they don't have a mediation. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's what... Well, this is what Kaku know. was doing with his new stuff on string theory. You know. Okay, so maybe he, I don't know about string theory. He's leaping over these uh, mediations and yeah. stuff. So Aristotle's notion of the mediator. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Uh, it, what do you What do you mean when you say we don't have political mediation today? Um, uh, so in other words, if we use the famous it's editions, a great proposition. That is a great that. proposition. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a very good question. Thinking about it in a good um, yeah. Yeah. So very good in, in in capital where. Um, We have this initial presentation of what capital is, right? So the mediator here is the commodity. So whatever and however the commodity functions in this relationship enables this, the, the movement from here to here can only happen, actually not like that, but the movement can only happen like this, right? So there are transformations here that occur that the commodity form functions as something that is present in both ends of this equation, right? And the way it is present in both ends enables the valorization of capital to happen. Right. And, but, and in different relations on, on the other end. Yeah. Exactly. So, so in other words, by the time you go from right. here to here, yeah. this yeah. takes time. This is yeah. a relation yeah. denominated in time, among other things. Right. 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 
right? And I don't know how long it takes for Ford to make the latest Ford Mustang, but they know at the factory level. I don't know what it is, three hours? Depends on it's in Korea or Mexico. Right, right. So, 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 I'm sorry. in other words, the, the transformation of, of money into commodity, into more money, uh, is a temporal relation, but it's also a transformative relation right. where this functions as the mediator. is something right. that's present in both in different ways. And Wait, what functions as the mediator? M. In this commodity. case, C. No, the, the commodity. Commodity. Yeah. Right. And, and the way the commodity functions at each level, at the beginning and at the end, uh, is different, but the presence of the commodity in there allows the valorization of capital to happen. Right. Do, what would be the equivalent relation if, the, if, we, if such relation exists in, in political relations? Where so, we don't talk about capital and commodities, so we talk about something else. I don't know, power, ideology, subjectivity, or uh, um, I, don't, I don't even know what the I don't yeah, even know what the so so M would be. Just help me understand why is money not the mediator here? Just help me. That was purely a devil's advocate question. You're so in other words, words, you're starting out with money. Yeah, but you can change it. Yeah, you can change it. I mean, the, the, what is the formula for the working for the proletariat? Yeah. The pure the the mediator is money there. I see. Mm -hmm. right. Again, that's a very good point because in dialectical logic, right. the answer changes completely depending on what your framework frame is. Right. Frame of, right. of observation, if you will. Right. If you point your attention to the working class, like he does in the, let's say, in, in, at a particular point, then you're, you basically enter everyday life as a commodity that has only one thing of value to, uh, to uh, those who will enable you to survive in a commodified society, your ability to labor over time and thus create a particular type of value that your employer has for their business, right? In exchange, you receive some fraction of the value that you created in monetary form as your wage, okay? You don't care about the commodity that you make. You just care about this. To you, this is the important point of your existence. Why? Because once you establish, once you obtain money after selling your labor time over eight hours today and you get some pre-agreed value in money back, you can take this money and then spend it on all the commodities that enable your survival. Right? So in the media well, you're you valorize values. the commodity there as well, no? When you valorize it, because you, you, you then are allowed to continue to go. Let's that say is a bar of I mean, that's the formula. It's not you exchange yourself as a commodity yeah. for a particular amount of money that you right. extract from the based on your contract. Now, this money, or at least most of it, you're going to have to spend. Why? Because you own no commodities. Well, it's a commodity. It's a you're a working class. You do not own a home. You do not own any forms of wealth that you can convert into income, for example, to buy commodities with. So the only way, and you don't have money. You start with a deficit of money, a lack of money. You acquire money in the process of work, selling your labor time, right? Uh, you get some money, and then you must spend most of it on the commodities that you don't own but you need. And thus, by the time you complete the circle, you have to go back to work and you repeat it again. And that becomes your social class membership. <laughs> now, Gary Becker rejects this. Gary Becker says every worker has capital in their labor. Labor, he redefines as capital. Human capital. Human capital. It's an extremely important intervention. It may not be true from the point of view of Marxist analysis of political economy, but it doesn't. Miss, I'm not totally convinced that, that the logic of contemporary capitalism that cannot be looked at in that way. Hence the vernacular. Could be. What do you bring to the table? I mean, what do you? you know, yeah. What skill do you have? Right, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to talk more about the concept more, of mediation. More, more, we'll do with Hegel, right. but it's a very important and difficult concept, but I, it's very, it's very, um, it's very useful. Um, look at this here. This is the predicate, which then functions as the subject, right? It is not present in the conclusion. This is the conclusion. But this thing here makes the conclusion possible because it establishes the link. Man is an animal, right? And thus completes this thing where Socrates is man, man is an animal, thus Socrates is an animal. This is the mediator. Man is the mediator in that particular syllogism. Maybe the other point. Uh, so earlier we were talking about the possibility of mediation in today's politics, but I think uh, uh, maybe we could turn, turn that question around and maybe we, we propose that politics itself is the 
Here of material reproduction, okay. politics guarantees the reproduction of global capital. So there's all kinds of. You should write that book. I mean, there's all kinds. I, I think of, it's something no, no, no. that's already written it. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah. so, so, so anyway, it's uh, so uh, so politics uh, the, being being the mediator in a way that it it functions as the. Uh, uh, it guarantees the disavowal of the <laughs> the presence of uh, the logic of global capital. So, uh, so an example would be whenever uh, something something bad happens, uh, what we what we hear in the media is humanitarian crisis or or uh, a certain spectacle in, in the political scene. So, so in, it, in, the, in, this, in, the, in the process of this round, not only uh, the discourse of the reproduction of the global capital is excluded, but the, the, the sphere of politics as such is also uh, displaced. Just to sort of add to it, I mean, since we're talking a little bit about, now that we've reached an important point, um, I mean, chapter five sort of defines the primary substance and so on and so forth, and we'll go there but briefly. But the, the important thing is this. To me, in the categories, once you reach the, the, the embryonic form of the syllogism, we have basically extracted a lot of value from the categories. Of course, there are other important things, which we'll mention, if not today, at the beginning of the next class, with the oppositions and quality and quantity, we have to talk about it. But if we just stay for two minutes on politics today, think about it. We live in a, we live like a very, uh, transformative times. So, for example, many things are breaking down in meaning. So, for example, the basic liberal notion of the division between pop the political, it's not just a liberal thing, the, the, the very modern European Enlightenment derived idea of the separation, which in its liberal form is the separation of the political versus the economic, is completely broken down in the United States, for example, in American politics and also global politics. Never came together. It never came together, right? But however, however, uh, if you're liberal, whether you're conservative in American liberal language, political language, or liberal liberal in American language, you understand and you believe that the political is primary, that you as a citizen of the American Republic, right, are the source of legitimacy and political power of this nation's uh, governing body, which is the state, right? The economic is just a separate part of everyday life, which is just as important. But the political is primary. That's the assumption. It has to be, right? Marxists would say yes, because uh, for obvious reasons, the political is where the class domination of the dominant social class, which is the wealth owners, is assured in the state, right? So the state, the American government apparatus is overwhelmingly, the Marxists would say, under the political influence of the wealthiest social class. You can, and then they'll make the arguments. Look at the president's social class, look at the class composition of the US Senate. There are exceptions like Lincoln or LBJ or you know Truman and so on and so forth. But it, anyways. The executive committee of the bourgeoisie. The executive committee of 1848. And then of course. Yeah, you said that? 1848, yes. the executive committee of the bourgeoisie. But Marx would still allow, and liberal thinkers will allow, that there is tension between the political and the economic domain. Right? They are not identical to each other in their internal logic of functioning. The economic domain, in this case of capitalism, has its own logic. The logic is towards monopolization. Competition, the freer the competition is, the closer monopolization will be created in different industry segments. Kaletsky wrote about that, the great Polish economist. Keynes wrote about that. Hyman, Minsky, you know, Marx. all the major American. Yeah, Sorry. Marx himself wrote about that. So non marx you know, Kaletsky was a Marxist, mm -hmm. Hyman, Minsky was not, but Keynes was not. So the economic has its own logic, monopolization. Right? The establishment of cartels, competition, once you outcompete, efficiency, there are all these. So this is one of the problems of a capitalist economy, but this is also part of it why it's so dynamic and produces so much wealth and so on and so forth. Creative destruction. All that is solid melt into thin air, as Marx said. Now, the political has its own logic. You can use Weber, the logic of bureaucratization, the logic of charismatic power and the different types of authority, right? Which has a different enough logic from the economic. 
And in political history, this, this follows the transition of, for example, homo economicus, that Adam Smith talks about in early liberal thinkers. So homo economicus, so what is human being? Human being is the economic creature, a creature that buys, sells, makes, produces, uses. This is what it means to be human. This prioritizes human life on the economic. The political is secondary, but it's still there. Then you have different treatments. Then, then Marx says humans are basically homo faber. You know, the labor, the creative creature that a human being is, is the essential feature of us, right? And to the extent that your political system or economic system permit this or not, you live in a, you know, dysfunctional world or not, right? Uh, and then liberals would come in, or, or social, you know, all kinds of intermediary political positions would say, well, we can merge the two, you know, homo economicus and homo father, and so on and so forth. Now, but what is happening today? Today, people increasingly are writing about this in various different languages. There's a collapse of the political. Why? Because the political functions literally to the logic of the economic. So elections are essentially run as, uh, as, marketing. Or, as marketing, essentially. There's no ideas. The ideas are superficial. They're yeah. stupid. Even the, the, the candidates know that it's a joke, right? So there's no debates on political notions. Even, like, for example, you, in American history, you would have, like, I don't know, debates between Lincoln and who was the senator? Doug Douglas. Douglas Lincoln debates. I mean, you read these debates, you're like, this happened in America? Look at the... Look at the intensity of the ideas in there, right? Or even in the 20th century, the debates like between FDR when he was trying to pack the Supreme Court, and you have all these uh, uh, public debates about why we need to change the course of the economy. And, and these were political conversations. Probably even as late as the Vietnam War in Washington, you had weighty kind of Fulbright, you know, in their own way. But what are the political debates today? It's complete nonsense, politically speaking. The ideas well, are trivial. This, of course, was uh, you know because of there is no alternative. The Tina syndrome, and yeah. also the really only revolution that we all lived through in a certain way after the '60s, which was the Reagan revolution right. that made the primacy of the economic everything. Right. Well, yeah. that we're wearing, you know, but it's not just a it's not just a liberal right. disease. Right. It's not only the liberal. The Marxist, right. the yeah. Soviet yeah. Union, Marxist in the nineteen. In the 1970s and 1980s, the Soviet government, the, the level of discourse about politics in the Soviet Union is also extremely low. There's, there's a crisis of ideas. Everybody thinks about the economic in the Soviet Union too. Produce more cars, produce more consumer goods. That becomes the overbearing And mechanical fetish. Marxism that came out of this. Yeah. There was an yeah. ideology only of economic determinism Volker in various forms. Vulgar Marxism, exactly. automatic Marxism, so, whatever you want. You know, politically you speaking, you want to if you agree that the economic has overtaken the political, right. which by the way, was already anticipated by Marx himself. He yeah, said, capitalist society will be consumed by the ideas of the capitalists, which are simple capital accumulation at the expense of political ideas, ethical ideas, any kind of aesthetics, right? So today, you can say we live in a much more truly capitalist society globally than we ever did before in the last 300 years. Only now, capitalism is showing its true potential. Financialization of nature. Yes, and in America, the most capitalist, most sophisticated capitalist society, that is expressed through essentially the destruction of the political. Right. There is no political in America today because politics is essentially thought through narrow financial capitalist terms. This is the crisis of production too in America. This is this is very dangerous, yeah. right? It requires new ideas that are political that will somehow control the economic and enforce its subservient status to the political. I mean, Aristotle prioritizes the political. The economy is just one aspect of the global community that we call the state, that he, in the English translation, you know, the overall the political community. The economic is part of that, but it, in other words, in Aristotle's conceptualization of the politics, the circle represents the political community. In other words, the community that contains all these different components which, if they're functioning according to their own nature, to their own essence, will produce a well-functioning society, of which one is the economic aspect of society. Others might be, uh, there are all kinds of different um, uh, uh, communities that consist of which the economic community is only one part. 
right? So today what we have is that this, which is just a part, an important subset of what enables so yeah. the existence, has become, right? Imposed itself as the guiding essential logic of not just the United States, but anywhere in the world, almost, right? So, so I think, I mean, I think that's what we need to conceptualize today. How do we resuscitate the political on what basis? Uh, yeah. I think, uh, well, in, in sort of a Hegelian spirit, perhaps we could say that the overtaking of the economic over, uh, over the political is, in a sense, the emergence of the new political. The new political, the new so political, what is the new political? The new political is the logic of capital. So, so this. So the economic logic. Uh, yes, the, this new economic logic opens up a new, as the new mediator opens up a new set of a, uh, 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 I don't want to interrupt, but I just want to make us as 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 plotty, as careful the conversation because you're mentioning these important things. So, it's not even the new politics is not just capitalist politics, it's financialized short-termism enabled by generalized computer networks. I, right? I, yeah. I, did, some, short -term I did some work a long time ago on the permanent yeah, income special. hypothesis. And I looked for a, a variety of ways to test that. And the fascinating, the thing to me that was the most fascinating result of the work is that the long-term both looking forward and looking backward uh, for a wide variety of areas in which I explored was only three years. And um, that's a very, uh, well, policy, all kinds of government policy has long-term effects. People really make those decisions based upon a very short-term view. And that's a, that's a, very significant factor. Right. The first sign That's a contradiction of, right there. Right? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah well, that, well, that, I mean, that, Social Security was, was created that I, way. I don't hear very well. But it's okay. Social Security seems to be created that way well, because nothing yeah, but in Social, Social Security, Security, like most things in the U.S., yeah, is yeah. sold on a false basis. Yes. And, and right. so the basis upon which yeah. anything is marketed right. is very different from mm -hmm. Any kind of well, real. I always say there's no such thing as reality, just as there's no such thing as truth. Reality is plural, and truth is plural. Mm -hmm. But um, the first sign to me of a real switch in tax policy in the U.S. is when Reagan put into his budget that special provision for that people who owned racehorses could have a tax deduction for racehorses. Now at that time, which was 1981, at that time there was not the commercial, I, I, my father's from Kentucky, so I like Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Derby's fun, Churchill Downs, I hear it. Yeah. At, at that time, there were none of these commercial stables. Right, right. Stables, horse racing stables, were all family, family activities. Yeah. It wasn't capitalist infused. Well, well, it was a, well, it was really large more, corporate. It yeah. was really more social than capitalist. Exactly. Political, close because to it political. always lost yeah. money, but it gained <laughs> prestige. <laughs> but but right. it was a very right. fascinating right. thing right. to put in a right. tax deduction because that was a very early indicator of a change in the way the, the taxes go. And as everybody in this room knows, I'm sure that the latest tax changes have privileged the very very few and will inevitably lead to a reduction in social benefits. Well, that's a great point of showing the, the dysfunctionality of thinking politically, yes. except to the narrowest of short-term economic gain for those who can get away with it. Yeah. So, okay, this is very, unfortunately we're at 829, so we have to cut it short, but I think it was good to have the political excursion. Why not? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Right. When it gets that concrete, like yeah, that. because otherwise the level of abstraction is devastatingly yeah. yeah. high in Aristotle's organon. So it's very good that we kind of made these um, uh, bridges. Just make them. a remark about going back to Popper, a very accessible text that's critical of Popper's anti dialectical thinking as Marcuse's book, huh. From Luther to Popper. Huh. And there's a very good essay called The Poverty of Historicism. <laughs> 
against <laughs> against uh, our token. Can I throw out one here. other long term point? Yes. Yes. And I don't know how you would handle this. The property of the store system. The population of the United States. Sorry, Lita. Let me just let's just spin. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I want to make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That would be interesting to read. Okay. Yeah. The population yeah. of the United States is increasing about 6% a year. Virtually every competent economist is forecasting long-term GDP or GNP, whichever way you're calculating, of about 2% per year, which means that on a per capita basis, we will continue to have less to consume on a per capita basis. And as inequality is bound to increase, as it has increased steadily since 1981, but its bound, inequality is bound to increase based upon current tax policy so that we will have less to share and more so that you certainly, in any kind of a long-term perspective, uh, are, are very difficult times facing and decisions will not be based well, on setting this. up a political structural political crisis it's structural. which is ignored well, which is i guess they're they're just saying that's what they're, that's what they're having now. that's what they're having in chile right now yeah. exactly <coughs> well interesting there's a but in a country as as wealthy in terms of its economic productivity and the average sort of to, to preside over a steady decline knowing the data uh -huh. that shows a profound Miss, because the because in, a, yeah. in, in previous aspects well, of but, history, but however, you need to really define wealth in a different way requires... because the wealth created is so, you know, McDonald's, right. Wendy's, right? Um, you know, franchise capital. All of these things are very important to, to look yeah. at in terms of when you begin to talk about wealth. Do we really want the consumption of? McDonald's, Burke, or sure, sure. McMuffin at this point, and what does that really actually contribute to GDP, you know, and how can these things be, you know, quote, rethought and reversed? And this is what the radical imagination really needs to do instead of, you know, just thinking this through, you know, how are you going to redistribute wealth, right? The old Rawlsing informed framework that, you know, justice is, is basically a Kantian redistribution you know, that would satisfy everybody. I, I think this is very important to think through, you know, that they're, I mean, given that we're doing relations among categories and universals yeah. and particulars here. And, and yeah, yeah, the yeah. absence of political yeah. thought yeah. and the imposition of yeah. economic, again, the word particular, right. particular, financial, late, early 21st century financial capital uh, organon, if you will, the, the use of that particular organon as political thinking, that's disastrous. Yeah. Because you're using certain line of thinking and you're applying it on an entire society's level, right? Over a long term, that can produce a literally a the disaster. The joke was always on GDP. It is gross. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 The focus on, on, on the opus of Randy of financial capital, so th these places, uh, Class struggle. So the class struggle uh, today is is more about those who are outside the sphere of the first world and those who are within. And, and in, in a sense, it, it's sort of, it's a refraction, a negative refraction, or the concrete universal of global capital that global capital has created new divisions. So this means that. Uh, uh, it's not only it's not enough to 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 think to rethink uh, the meaning of political, uh, but also uh, we have to fully embrace the situation that we're from in. So 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 uh, perhaps uh, I'm su I'm suggesting is that it it might be more productive to see the the new way of financial capital. Uh, as as ambivalent, it, it's not not only an evil, but also but also it's it, it gives it gives rise to new possibilities. Very quickly, we can simply enslave the bankers, and the surplus value they create can be shared amongst uh, the whole globe. But we 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 need a very strong global agency. Uh, so so more alienation. 
more uh, <laughs> more more bureaucracy <laughs> and more ego. Yes. Um, I mean, in, in a certain sense, if I can be a little vulgar and reductionistic, yes. so we have to become I think more what's evil happening before we become yeah, 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 we've got to pass the evil. Yeah, more I think what's happening. Evil lies more evil. No, no, but just to continue this previous <laughs> thought, and, and, and along this, I think what's happening, if, we can re, if I can be reductionistic, I think what's happening is we're witnessing the death or the foreclosure of the best parts of the European Enlightenment. In terms of ideas about politics, wait, but you say that again. I think we're witnessing the foreclosure, the end of the most interesting ideas of the European Enlightenment. That's 40 years running now. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, in other words, Habermas yeah. is the one who wanted to go back to the Enlightenment. Well, certain Whereas representatives Leo of the Enlightenment. And others said, forget it. Yeah, you know? they, they really did. But the problem, is, debate, the problem is, the problem is the Enlightenment yeah. ideas are closed, yeah. like, for yeah. example, yeah. reason. Yeah. Or yeah. thought yeah, and all these course. things, yeah. but nothing is replacing right. them other than simplistic, uh, technologically underpinned, automated behaviors, which right. are. It's almost like we're 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 sub the next generation of of subjectivity is a dumbed down version of the previous generation. Literally, right. you can use the education paradigm and the dumbing down of schooling. Right. right? You can you can look at the decreasing quality of the average member of society intellectually in terms of what is it that they do daily, right? Yeah. Or what, 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 their awareness of the world, you know? Um, I think so, so these are, you know, real symptoms. I, I think 30%, I heard a statistic on, on, on NPR that 30% of Americans or 20% of Americans believe the world is flat. How can you Those do are that? the ones who just admit they believe that. <laughs> How is that possible that the world is flat? Right. In, 21st century, uh, uh, among 21st century citizens of the world. Like how? They've been reading about the three you know? <laughs> or that the dinosaurs, you know, did not exist. I know what's in the world is a donut. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a cosmic muffin. Yeah. Listen, uh, next week we have a problem. Uh, I'm going to meet email. two friends who are having a birthday.